snow, ice, shivering winds, and frozen wastelands. A white silence stretches from horizon to horizon. This is our planet 2.4 billion years ago, at the very beginning of the Proterozoic Eon. The world entered a state of global glaciation when even the equatorial regions were covered in ice. This global freezing event, known as the Huronian glaciation, lasted until 2.1 billion years ago and is believed to have been triggered by a chain of successive factors. As we already know, by 2.4 billion years ago, photosynthesizing cyanobacteria had enriched our planet's atmosphere with oxygen, causing the great oxidation event. Although this enrichment ultimately created an environment that could sustain complex life, it came at a price. It likely caused the planet's first mass extinction. To most of the microorganisms that populated Earth at that time, oxygen was a poisonous gas. But an even more dramatic consequence of this event was that oxygen replaced greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. The amount of carbon dioxide, which is known for keeping our planet warm, dropped dramatically. And methane, an even more powerful greenhouse gas which had dominated our atmosphere since the Hadean Eon, was reduced to the trace levels we see today. One reason why the concentration of CO2 dropped was the formation of the first large supercontinent, Canorland. When this large landmass became exposed to the air, CO2, which was dissolved in rain droplets, fell to the rocky ground and became trapped in the sediments, being withdrawn from the atmosphere. With much less greenhouse gas to trap the heat, the global climate became cooler, and ice sheets started to build in the polar regions and the highlands. As the ice grew, the albedo effect kicked in. White glaciers and snow-covered areas reflected the sunlight back to space, preventing the atmosphere from accumulating heat, thus cooling it even further. It didn't take long for the enormous glaciers to build up and advance from the north and south to meet at the equator. This was not the first time that glaciers had appeared on Earth. In fact, 2.9 billion years ago, there was an ice age known as the Pongola glaciation, but it was nothing like as severe as the Huronian event. Now, for the first time, the whole planet became icebound and entered a state known as the Snowball Earth. And apparently, life was at least one of the factors responsible for it. It was a time of several long ice ages, when glaciers advanced and retreated for 300 million years, with the longest ice age lasting for 100 million years. But how did life survive this freezing catastrophe? Although Earth was mostly frozen, there were some ice-free areas. They formed near geothermal vents and fields that would melt the ice around them, just like we see in Iceland and Antarctica today. Such places would have been perfect for life to survive, and even thrive. Some microorganisms could have lived in subglacial lakes like they do today in Antarctica's Lake Vostok. Others could have lived in air bubbles that were frozen in the ice. Finally, they could have occupied cryoconite holes that melted in ice under the accumulation of mineral dust and volcanic ash. Such holes are present in many modern-day glaciers. Earth remained frozen until 2.1 billion years ago, when it suddenly broke through its icy trap. But what made it possible for our planet to escape its snowball state? The first answer is volcanoes. During the entire time of glaciation, they pumped greenhouse gases into the atmosphere until there was a sufficient amount to keep the planet warm again. The second answer would be our fortunate position at the optimal distance from the sun. If Earth had been located marginally farther out, it would probably have remained frozen until today, being not much different from cold, dry Mars. 2.2 billion years ago, Earth entered an unusual time known as the Loma Gundy excursion, when oxygen in the oceans and atmosphere was in abundance, but there were no organisms to consume or breathe it. Things probably remained like this for around 200 million years until the first organisms capable of efficient use of oxygen arrived. These organisms were the eukaryotes. In contrast to the simple internal structure of already existing prokaryotes, with their genes freely swimming in cytoplasm inside of the cell walls, Eukaryotes had their DNA neatly packed inside the nucleus in the center of the cell. 
Moreover, they possessed very important organelles called mitochondria that were responsible for breathing oxygen and producing energy. While early eukaryotes were still single-celled organisms, they were 10 times larger than prokaryotic cells. It is believed that the earliest eukaryotes existed at least 1.9 billion years ago, while the first known eukaryotic fossils come from 1.8 billion year old rocks. These oldest eukaryotes belong to a diverse group of mysterious microfossils, collectively called acrotogs, which in Greek means unknown origin. Today, scientists believe that they were the first single-celled eukaryotic algae, or the first phytoplankton of the Proterozoic Oceans. Although acrotogs were minute organisms, no larger than 0.15 millimeters across, they were giants in comparison to prokaryotic life forms. Some of these eukaryotic acrotogs, like Dictyosphera, were round with smooth surfaces, while others, like Sheosphiridium, were covered with tiny spines or processes. There is even a 1.6 billion year old spiny acrotog called Tapania, whose morphology suggests that it might be related to fungi. At least 1.87 billion years ago, but possibly even 200 million years earlier, a peculiar organism called Grapania spiralis appears in the fossil record. Unlike anything else that lived at this time in the oceans, thin, tube-shaped Grapania reached several centimeters in length and therefore could be seen with the naked eye. It lived in water and was likely attached with one end to the bottom sediments. Scientists are still not certain what Grapania was. While some suggest it was a colony or string of prokaryotic cyanobacteria, Others consider it to be an early, true eukaryotic alga. This mysterious organism survived and remained virtually unchanged for another 1.2 billion years, almost until the end of the Proterozoic Eon. While scientists remain puzzled by Grapania, there is another enigmatic organism that seems to be completely out of place on the timescale. Meet Discagma butanae, an extremely problematic 2.2 billion year old fossil from South Africa. It was small, from 0.3 to 1.8 millimeters in size, and shaped like a tiny urn with an opening at the top. But the most fascinating thing about Discagma was that it lived on land. Its tiny fossils were connected into bunches by threads on the surface of ancient soil, strikingly resembling modern fungi. The problem is, it appears in the fossil record much earlier than any known eukaryotic organism. Therefore, Discagma must have been something simpler than plant, animal or fungus. Perhaps it was a prokaryotic organism. If not, the emergence of eukaryotes would have to be pushed back at least 300 million years. Nevertheless, somewhere during the first half of the Proterozoic Eon, the earliest eukaryotes appeared, marking the beginning of multicellular life as we know it, giving rise to three new biological kingdoms. Plants, fungi, and animals which are all forms of eukaryotes. If we were to look at our planet from space 1.8 billion years ago, we would see the land masses combined into a supercontinent called Columbia or Nuna. It existed from 1.82 to 1.35 billion years ago until it broke apart as every supercontinent eventually did. The land most likely looked reddish like the Martian surface but on Earth, it was surrounded by blue oceans and topped with a layer of white, curly clouds. As oxygen became widespread in the atmosphere, the soil started to corrode. The weathering process activated by oxygen started to destroy granites and basalts that contained iron, turning them into rusty red soil. Between 1.8 billion to 800 million years ago, life on Earth was stagnating. No complex organisms appeared, and no cataclysms or drastic climate changes occurred. The history of Earth was decidedly dull and uneventful for a full billion years. Scientists call this period the Boring Billion. But what was the cause of this continuous and tedious stability? And did nothing interesting actually happen for such a long stretch of time? Indeed, life was already capable of oxygenic photosynthesis. Oxygen-producing cyanobacteria were in place, but for some reason, the atmosphere and oceans did not contain enough oxygen to sustain any complex life forms. Something was keeping the oxygen levels too low. 
At this time, oxygen-releasing life forms coexisted and competed with sulfur-using organisms, green and purple sulfur bacteria, and methanogens, archaea that produced methane. Neither of the latter organisms produced oxygen. The oceans during the boring billion were stratified. There was a thin three to six meter deep surface layer that was oxygenated and inhabited by photosynthesizing single-celled green algae, including acrotogs. Below this clean layer and down to the bottom, the waters were completely anoxic and populated with purple sulfur microbes and methanogens. Towards the end of the boring billion, when oxygen-producing organisms finally outnumbered sulfur-using bacteria, as well as methane-generating archaea, oxygen levels started to increase, paving the way for the emergence of complex life forms. By one billion years ago, a red alga called Bangiomorpha discovered in the Canadian Arctic appears in the fossil record. Despite its antiquity, it strikingly resembles Bangia, a genus of red alga that exists today. Fascinatingly, Bangiomorpha, which inhabited the shallow seafloor just a little more than one billion years ago, had male and female spores, making it the first known sexually reproducing organism. In 2020, Chinese scientists discovered a peculiar fossilized green seaweed called Proterocladus anticus that came from one billion year old rocks. It was only two millimeters in size, but of enormous importance. It may be the oldest fossilized green plant ever found. As we have just seen, the Boring Billion was a time when a number of important changes took place and probably wasn't that dull after all. When it officially ended 800 million years ago, the land masses assembled into another supercontinent called Rodinia, which derives from the Russian verb to give birth and was surrounded by the ocean Merovia, from the Russian word mir, which means world. The land was still devoid of any complex life. Only bacterial mats surrounded the water bodies and wet areas, but in the ocean, things were quite different. While bacterial mats like soft and colorful carpets covered the bottom between mounds and pillars of stromatolites, the water column was populated with microscopic organisms, and substantial areas of the seafloor were covered with kelp-like seaweeds. It's likely that the first animals or metazoans appeared at this time in the form of single-celled protists called coanoflagellates. These organisms look like little sacs with a collar around a thread-like appendage called a flagellum. As the flagellum beats, it pulls water through the collar where all of the food particles are collected. Coanoflagellates are known to form colonies where newborn cells don't float apart but stay together with the others. In cooperation, they use their flagella to create a powerful filtering system. At some point, different cells started performing different functions. Some were responsible for feeding, while others formed the outer protective layer, and this is how true metazoans emerged. Sponges are believed to be the very first animals to appear on Earth. Indeed, the earliest animal fossils belong to a sponge-like organism discovered in Namibia that existed 760 million years ago. It was named Otavia antiqua. Ranging from half a millimeter to five millimeters in size, Otavia fed on algae and bacteria, sucking them through their tiny pores into a central body cavity where the food was processed. These animals likely formed colonies that sat on the seafloor between algae, filtering water for food. Around 720 million years ago, Earth started to cool down again. In fact, there were at least two subsequent glaciations, and quite possibly, our planet turned into a giant snowball once again. These glaciations are thought to have been caused by similar factors that caused the Huronian event the increase of oxygen in the atmosphere, and chemical weathering as the Rodinia supercontinent started to split apart. Both processes removed CO2 from the atmosphere, making it cooler. This ice age lasted for 85 million years until 635 million years ago, and the whole time period was named the Cryogenium. 
Once again, volcanoes eventually replenished the atmosphere with CO2 and thawed the global ice cover, returning the climate to normal. And Earth has never since experienced such severe glaciations as seen in Proterozoic times. Around 620 million years ago, the majority of land masses gathered together in the southern hemisphere and formed another supercontinent called Panocia. Its assemblage coincided with another ice age called the Gaskias glaciation, but it lasted only 340,000 years and was not nearly as severe as the previous ones. It appears that at that time, Earth just managed to escape another snowball state. The final 94 million years of the Proterozoic Eon are named the Ediacaran period, and this is when truly strange and almost alien creatures appeared. Around 570 million years ago, in what is now Newfoundland, Canada, one kilometer below the water surface on the dark sea floor, we encounter the first large complex multicellular organisms. Spindle-shaped bodies of Fractofusus that reached up to 40 centimeters lay on the soft microbial mats, connected to their young with stolen-like filaments. Cabbage-like Bradgatia reached about 20 centimeters and was attached to the bottom with a bulbous holdfast in the center of several leaf-like petals. Fronds of Charnia masoni that looked like large feathers bending back and forth in the water currents reached up to 60 centimeters while two-meter-tall trapassia towered over this deep-water garden. All of these organisms are collectively called rangiomorphs and are distinguished by their unusual structure that is unknown in anything that lives today. Their bodies branched into fractal modules of four subsequently smaller orders. Each module was composed of a series of smaller modules that looked exactly like the full creature. Scientists are having difficulty determining what these organisms actually were. Lichens? Animals? Fungi? Giant single-celled creatures? Or were they a completely different form of life that vanished long ago, one that deserves to be put into a separate, now extinct kingdom? While the debate is still on, we know for certain that rangiomorphs were not plants, although superficially they looked like them. Plants require sunlight to perform photosynthesis, but these organisms lived far too deep down in the water for light to reach them. Another question is how and on what did these creatures feed? The common thinking is that they were practicing osmotrophic feeding, a passive absorption of dissolved organic carbon from the water. This is probably why the rangiomorphs grew fractally, increasing their surface area to absorb as many nutrients as possible. Later, around 560 million years ago, we still encounter rangiomorphs like Charnia and six-lobed rangia. But along with them, new types of strange organisms start to appear in the fossil record. They look like pancakes that were lying on the top of microbial mats, most likely feeding on them. This group of Ediacaran biota has been named the Proarticulates and is mostly known from ancient shallow marine environments of northwestern Russia and southern Australia. Two of the most well-known proarticulates are the 25-centimeter-long Yorgia and its larger, one-meter-long relative, Dickinsonia. These creatures consisted of two rows of tubes, or isomers, that radiated to the sides from the central axis of the organism. The most confounding part about these creatures is that they lack mouths and guts, as well as any external sensory or reproductive organs. Scientists also think that proarticulates were able to move around on the sea bottom in search of new food sources. For example, when Dickinsonia had absorbed the entire microbial mat beneath its body, it moved to another location to keep feeding. Indeed, there are traces of fossils of Dickinsonia and Yorgia that show multiple imprints of the same organism, hinting to its mobility. Additionally, a recent study of lipid biomarkers extracted from Dickinsonia fossils revealed something fascinating. Cholesterol. This indicates that they might have been animals after all. While the affinity of Dickinsonia and its kin is still debated, there was another Ediacaran creature called Kimberella, whose classification is more or less agreed upon. Trace fossils suggest that it was mobile, bilaterally symmetrical, and might have possessed a feeding organ with teeth similar to that of mollusks. This is why Kimberella is thought to be a bilaterian animal, 
possibly an early mollusk that grazed upon microbial mats, as modern snails do. But the most convincing discovery, indicating that the first organisms resembling modern animals appeared in Ediacaran times, before the Cambrian explosion, was made in 2020. Through most of the second part of the Ediacaran period, there is fossil evidence of burrows that with time gradually increased in complexity and were most certainly made by worm-like animals. But the makers of these burrows had remained elusive. Finally, rocks from South Australia revealed 555 million year old fossils of a tiny worm-like animal that was named Icaria warutia. It lived and made its burrows among other Ediacaran organisms of uncertain origins. But Icaria was something far more familiar. While this several millimeter long organism was neither impressive nor pretty, it's hard to overestimate its significance. Scientists believe that animals like Icaria arrived just before the time when life radiated into a huge variety of fauna, such as worms, mollusks, arthropods, and even vertebrates. Earth's long four billion year journey was a prerequisite for life to achieve today's wonderful diversity. After the Proterozoic Eon was over, life literally burst into various forms and shapes. During the next 540 million years, in what is called the Phanerozoic Eon, life inhabited all possible ecological environments. From vast oceans, to land, and even the air changing this ancient planet into the place we call home.